scheduling is the other side of the coin. When we talked about process management, we're talking about how a process, the CPU instructions are actually getting executed. However, there is now another thing that we have to consider. Think of a single processor with 10 processes. Well, what process gets to run on the CPU next? So say I pulled process A out, when does B run? And so it's not as simple as, well, now B, now C, now D, because some processes have higher priorities than others. For example, if I'm playing a video, it needs to be quicker than if I'm playing a PowerPoint because PowerPoint just essentially just is static and shows me whatever I need. But a video is changing over and over and over again. And so scheduling is a little bit more involved than just eh, go to the next one. Although one of the scheduling algorithms is what's known as round robin where we just eh, go to the next one. So what we're going to talk about today are scheduling, what it is, the terms involved with scheduling, multitasking, how we actually have multiple processes running on a single processor. We'll talk about preemption versus cooperation. Essentially what that means is when does the process give up the CPU? When is it like, okay, I'm done, next, and then it waits its turn again. Then we'll talk about starvation. Starvation is a term used meaning that whenever a process needs resources, they're not available. And so it, it seems to lag. So for example, if this was, if the video that you're playing right now was being starved of CPU resources, it'd be all jerky. It'd probably start popping the audio and stuff like that. Talk about priorities. That means some processes are higher priority or lower priority than other. Arbitration, how we actually decide between the two. And then the different process types. So everything we typically do on a laptop or on a computer such as this one is what's known as interactive. We're interacting with the process. However, supercomputers, you don't really interact with them. You say, here's all your inputs, here's where to put the outputs, and go. That's what's known as a batch or a batch program. And then we talk about real time. So if you ever have a car that's controlling a car engine or something like that, it's what's called real time. So real time means that at real time, this needs to happen. So let's go ahead and start with scheduling. So it's the act of picking which process runs next. It can be as simple, it's the next process in the list. However, sometimes that leads to other problems like starvation. It's invoked by either preemption or cooperation. Cooperation is an actual system call called yield. Linux actually has the yield system call, even though it is a preemptive operating system. So the yield system call, as soon as it, it remember a system call causes the user space to go immediately into kernel space and then handle whatever that's going to be. So in cooperative, it says yield, the scheduler knows it just got a yield call. It pulls that process off the processor, picks the next one, and puts it on the processor. The other way is through what's known as preemption. Preemption means that some external force is actually arbitrating which process or how much time they get on a process. The operating system you're going to use in this class is a preemptive operating system where we actually have a timer sitting in the background, and it periodically fires. And every time it fires, it invokes the scheduler, which chooses the next process to put on the side of the CPU. Now, what's interesting about preemption in the timer is in Linux, it's one over 1,000. That's the, the fastest you can make the timer, 1,000 hertz, which means every process is given a period of time one over 1,000 seconds. So it's a very short amount of time. But if you think about the speed of our CPUs and things like that, that's still millions of instructions that are executing. So there are two different ways we can view a process, a short-term process. For example, if I type LS, it's a short-term process. It's going to do its work and get out. However, a long-term process is something that really has an undefined time, such as Firefox or some sort of top program or something that we get to decide when it quits. It doesn't just do a task. And so a long-term versus a short-term process is essentially how long it's going to take. And a lot of times that can be known or at least predicted. So we talked about cooperation. It's a scheduler cannot tell a process, hey, you need to give me the CPU. That would require preemption. So in cooperation, remember it's a system call, which is an actual instruction that the process that is in a cooperative multitasking environment has to execute. Well, hopefully it's very evident what the problem with that is. It has no idea what the other processes are. It is the only one, it's the, only, it's the sole king of the jungle right there. And so it can lead to starvation because it's like, I want the CPU until I'm done. And so I'm never giving it back. And so with a cooperative multitasking system, you require the process itself to give back resources. 
This is very rarely used in most uh, production level operating systems and things like that. And it can easily lead to starvation. So starvation means that a process that needs resources, remember the CPU is the resource that we're trying to use. It hasn't given enough of the CPU. So the instructions that are required to run haven't been ran yet. And so you experience lag. Things don't start working right. Obviously, if this was a real-time system, something where I need to control the piston or the valve so that the fuel fires right now, this isn't going to work because you're going to have several delays and things like that. Then we have preemptive scheduling. This is what you're going to be using. This is what you're going to be programming. So preemptive scheduling means that the scheduler is invoked, but it's by an arbitrator, some sort of master king or something like that inside the CPU. And that comes from the form of a external timer interrupt. So the timer is actually sitting on the, the RISC-V CPU, and its job is just to fire, 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 fire at a period, at a periodic time. For example, like in Linux, like I said, it fires one over one thousandth of a second. In this one, it's something like one over 250 if of a second. So it's, it's fairly quick. And the quicker it is, the less time each process gets, but the more processes you can get to per second. And so there is a trade-off between the two. Do I want this program to run to completion, then switch to the next one? Well, for an interactive processes, it's almost impossible. You type something, and then a second later, something shows up. That would be very annoying. So one thing is... Some processes have to keep getting a CPU over and over again before the other processes can. That's because they have a higher priority, which is kind of strange because in Linux, a negative number actually is a higher priority than a positive number. So 100 is a very low priority, and in Linux, it's 20 to negative 20. So 20 would be a very low priority, or negative 20, it would just keep getting the scheduler. So prioritization has to be incurred. So in the algorithms, our scheduling algorithms, we actually have to look at prioritization and see, okay, remember, scheduling is I need to choose what process needs to run. And so if I'm looking at a process that needs to run and it has a higher priority, the chances that it's going to run again are increased. And so that's what leads us to arbitration. A lot of times whenever I do PS or VIM or something like that, they all have the same priority. And so we have to have some sort of arbitration. And most arbitration uses what's called round robin, where it just goes to the next process in the list. Wherever you are, it's just a table. And wherever you are on the table, that's when you're going to get it. But there are other things that we can incorporate in there when the process was created. Remember, the long-term versus short-term, if it was created 10 days ago, well, it's been running this whole time. Well, maybe it needs a little bit of CPU or maybe it doesn't. And these are the, the variables that have to go into your scheduling algorithm. So when we talk about batch scheduling, batch scheduling, it means the job is performed. There's no interaction. All the inputs are known, and then it runs. And so with batch scheduling, essentially we know it's batch scheduling by the runtime. The runtime is known more or less, plus or minus some sort of tolerance, ahead of time. So when we go to the supercomputer, we budget an amount of time because batch scheduling says, here are the inputs, here are the outputs. And because of that, well, you don't know the outputs, but you want the outputs. But since you know the inputs and all the code, you can sort of predict how long it's going to last or how long it's going to run. And so there are two scheduling items, first come, first serve. So think of it this way, uh, just traffic line. You go through the light and it turns red for every single car. Well, the first one in line, he gets to go across the street and execute and more or less in whatever terms you want. And then the next one in line gets go. So the first one that is in the queue, they're the, the, the first one to get served. And so if you're way back in the line, it's not gonna, it, you're not going to get served in a long time. Now, there's a problem with that as it can lead to starvation for shorter running time. So remember, the whole purpose of this is to make the CPU as busy as possible, get everything done as quickly as possible. And so there's what's called shortest job first. So this only works with batch scheduling because we know the, the length of the runtime. For example, I have Firefox, I have Zoom, I have this camera up, all that sort of stuff. It, there's no way we can predict how long these processes are going to run. And so that's why they're not considered batch algorithm or batch processes, they're considered interactive processes. For batch scheduling like this, we essentially have two different ways that we can do batch scheduling. First come, first serve. So say we have process A, process B, and then process C. So the width of these is the runtime. So let's just give this a quantity of two. Let's give this a quantity of five and then this a quantity of one. Okay, so what's going to happen is this is process A, process B, process C. And so in a first come first serve, A is going to run, B 
B is going to run next, and then C is going to run next. However, C only requires one time quantum, whereas B requires five. And so let's do a little bit of algorithm analysis here. So A is going to start at time quantum zero. It doesn't have to wait. B has to wait for A to complete, so it's going to start at time quantum two. And then C, even though it takes a runtime of one, it has to wait until time quantum seven. Well, let's see if we can do a better idea. So this is what's called first come, first serve. We also have what's called shortest job first. And so what we do is we have this list and we, short, we sort whichever job comes first or whichever job is the shortest. And so we can see C has a job duration of one. So C, A, B should be the algorithm that, or the sorting that we have here. So let's go ahead and do that. And let's do the analysis again. Oops, that's B. There we go. So C has one, A has two, B has five. Okay, so C, because it's the first one, doesn't have to wait, so it has a time quantum of zero. That's the waiting time. A has to wait one time, and B has to wait three. So let's take a look at this. Now B had to wait two, and now it has to wait three. So it's only increased by one time quantum. However, look at C. C went from seven to zero. Okay, the maximum waiting time for the first come first serve algorithm for this given example is seven. So we have zero, two, and seven. However, look, whenever we converted that into a shortest job first, now I have a zero, one, and three. And in fact, you can do the math on this, but shortest job first is the most efficient match algorithm. There is an easy way to prove that CAB sorting this by the shortest job first is the most efficient way to do it. So in batch scheduling, shortest job first is your quickest way to do it. Remember, what we have to do is we load all the jobs in first, it sorts the scheduling algorithm, and then it runs. So if you add something else while another job is running. So another thing about batch scheduling is a process cannot be preempted, and it's not multitasking. So A runs to completion. B runs to completion. So A and B cannot be running simultaneously or trading off the scheduler like an interactive process. And so that's another identifier for batch scheduling. Then we'll talk about uh, interactive scheduling. So in interactive scheduling, this is typically what you will use or what you have been interacting with in the Tesla machines, Hydra machines, and your, on your own computer. Interactive scheduling means that the process has an undefined duration. That means it can run for 10 seconds, it can run for one second, it can run for 200 seconds, who knows. And so what we have to do is we have to build the algorithms around that fact. So not only is that, but it's not like a batch scheduling algorithm where a process doesn't just run to completion. Otherwise, we'd have one process at a time, it runs to completion. Well, if it had an infinite amount of time that needed to run, nothing else could run, leading to starvation in your computer would just basically not work at all. So let's take a look at the three algorithms that we have. We have round robin, multi-level, and multi-level feedback. So whenever we talk about round robin, it's the simplest one to conceptualize. Let's say we have three processes. And it doesn't really matter if it's preemptive multitasking or cooperative multitasking because as soon as it gives up the process, so remember these are indefinite amount of time. So the size of these does not represent, unlike it did in the batch schedule, it does not represent its run time. And so with round robin, as soon, let's take a look at preemptive. So as soon as the preemptive timer comes in, the scheduling order moves from A to B. And then B gets to run for a, like one one thousandth of a second, whatever the timer value is, and then it switches from B to C. As soon as C gets that one one thousandth of a second, it goes back up to A. And we just do this over and over and over and over again. So that's why it's called round robin, because it's, it's a circular list. A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. Now if I added something else like D, it would get fit. So this is a doubly circular linked list. As soon as we hit D now, that's when we go back up to A. So hopefully you can see, whenever we had A, B, C, the runtime is, is after two preemptions, B and C, we get back to A. Now if we add D after three preemptions, we get back to A. And so if I had a lot of processes inside of the scheduling algorithm, you can see that round robin is going to starve whomever was first. So A runs, and now it has to wait 15, 20, 30 processes before it runs again. And what if A is a, a top priority? So notice that priority doesn't even factor into the round robin uh, scheduling algorithm. Instead, we just go A to B, B to C, C to D, D back up to A. And so it's a circularly linked list, and it's very easy to implement.
because you just say next, 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 next. And it, it does that, no problem. So remember, if I add a process, it actually slows down everybody's time quantum. So everybody still gets one one thousandth of the timer, but the chance to get back to that is a lot longer. So if, let's say we had a time quantum of one. So A takes one, B takes one, C takes one, D takes one. So A runs. Now it has to wait one, has to wait two, has to wait three before we get back up to A again. And then it runs. And then we have to wait one, we have to wait two, we have to wait three before we go back to, to A. Now what if I added E? with a time quantum of one. Well, A goes to B, so A just ran, it's fine. So it has to now wait one, and now has to wait two, it now has to wait three, and it now has to wait four before it comes back up. So you can see that the round robin scheduling algorithm is really efficient for a short number of processes. But as the number of processes increases, the efficiency of the algorithm decreases. So the other thing we have is what's called multi-level. So to solve this and to add priority, into our scheduling elements, they have multi-level and multi-level feedback. Now, <clears throat> the first half of multi-level feedback is exactly multi-level, so there's no difference. It's just that we add the feedback portion of it. And so, whenever you're implementing a multi-level feedback algorithm, you actually do multi-level first. After that, then you do the feedback portion of it. So let's take a look at what that means. So in a multi-level, now what we do is we have little buckets And the number of buckets is equal to the number of priorities we have. So let's say we had priorities one, two, and three, where one is the most priority, or most or the highest priority, and three is the lowest priority. Okay. So now we have these, and these are little buckets where we can store processes. So let's say we store A, we store B, and we store C here. Then we store D, E, F, and then G, H, and I. Okay, so here we have nine different processes, A through I. And what's going to happen in a multi-level, what it does is it always looks at the top priority. If there's somebody inside the top priority, it will get executed. Now notice there are three processes inside the top priority. And so what it does is it can go from A to B, B to C, and then C back to A. And so as soon as it finds that bucket, whichever bucket needs to run, it uses the round robin scheduling algorithm just for that bucket. Now, here's the problem. How do we ever go from A, B, C down to D? Well, you don't, and that's the problem with multi-level feedback. As long as there is a high priority process, you will never go to a lower priority, and that's why they added multi-level feedback. So, for example, as long as there's something in this priority number one, A, B, and C, A, B, C, A, B, C. Let's say C quits, now it's gonna go A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. Let's say B quits, now it's gonna go A, 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 A. And then if A quits, now the multi-level feedback can go D, E, F, D, E, F. Does that make sense? So in there, this leads to starvation because three has never run. Let's say A, B, and C take 10 time quantums each. And so that's 10 plus 10 plus 10, that's 30 time quantums before two, D, E, or F has any chance of executing. Gotta sneeze again. And so the number of priorities, so in Linux you have 21 or 41 priorities, negative 20 to positive 20. So you have 40 priorities. This would never work because your 20 priority level would just never execute. Now, if all priorities were exactly the same, so if I created all processes, they all had priority one, then this looks just like, and it has the exact same algorithm as a round robin. Because remember, in each one of these priority buckets, it's round robin scheduling. And so what they did is they added MLF. So ML is the exact same thing. So whenever we're picking the next process, let's say we just did a yield or we did a cooperative multi, or a preemptive, or we were preempted, and let's say we had the exact same things again. We have A, B, C, okay? So it's still priority one, priority two, priority three. So just like the MLF, we are going to, I'm sorry, the ML, we're going to go to the top priority first. So we go here and we choose the process A, okay? However, so now we picked A, but whenever A gets preemptive or it yields, the feedback portion says two things. Number one, it adds one to the quantum multiplier. So we talked about the quantum multiplier. Remember, so if my time quantum is one one thousandth of a second, now we're gonna add one to the time quantum. So now we got two one thousandth of a second. Okay, so it just increases the amount of time that it sits on the CPU. And then 
it lowers the priority. So in this case, as soon as it's parameter, so A ran once and only once, and now A gets moved into this bucket. And then B gets to run, it does the same thing. So now B gets moved down to this, and then C gets moved down into bucket number two. And then as you can see, what's going to happen is if A, B, and C take 10 time quantums, it, it only runs for one, two, and three. So D gets ran after time quantum four instead of like it did here where it ran after time quantum 30. So you can see what's happening is everything eventually filters down into the lowest priority level. However, the, the quantum multiplier is increased. And so the quantum multiplier is increased so that we reduce the amount of time it takes to actually switch one process off and add another switch. Now, whenever you do this for your lab, you'll notice that there's a lot of lag because as the time quantum increases, the time quantum is what determines when the next process or when that process that's running on the CPU will be preemptive. So the longer that time, the more time it has on the CPU, the less likely it's going to get preempted. And so that takes a lot of time. It, it, it doesn't help. So what's going to happen is the time quantum on the labs that you have is the maximum time quantum is 100. And so it's going to do 100. So if we do one over 100th of a second, actually, if it has a time quantum of 100, it's going to do one second on the CPU. So if I type something, you won't see anything appear to the screen until that process that handles the typing actually gets, uh, so if, say we had five different processes and the typing process was the very last one. Well, it's gonna take five seconds before that typing actually shows up. So as you can see, the multi-level feedback fixes the multi-level problem because with the multi-level problem, as long as I have a high priority process, we never ever get to the lower priority processes. And so multi-level is mainly for short-term processes that really need to run. So priority is a very important thing, but the higher priority processes are shorter. And that's typically the only way multi-level is going to work. Otherwise, we starve DEF, GHI, those processes in here. Multi-level feedback fixes that by increasing the time quantum, but also lowering the priority. And so even though it was, it started, A, B, and C started at priority one, it eventually moves to level two. And after it runs in level two, it moves down to level three. But just like ML, anything inside this priority uses the round robin scheduler. So it goes A, B, C. Now, since all th three of those run, then I'll go D, E, F, G, H, I, and then run back. I'm sorry, it won't do G, H, I. It'll go A, B, C again. And then all of them will be in the third, the third priority. So those are the three different algorithms that you will actually be implementing. And that's the round robin, multi-level, and multi-level feedback. Then we have what are known as real-time schedulers. Real-time schedulers mean there is some sort of deadline. You must do something by this time. And that's typically used for real-time systems such as engine control units, um, some sort of radios, things where if you miss this deadline, it can have a catastrophic result. Now, there's two ways that we can schedule processes that are real-time processes. In Linux, you can actually use the schedule there's a system call. I don't want to, it's not scheduled. I can't remember what it's called now. But Linux actually has a system call where you can change the scheduling algorithm from a interactive to a real time to a soft real time to a hard real time. So soft real time means that you will get your process ran here at this wall time, plus or minus a certain amount of slop. Just it, there's some tolerances to it. Hard real time is uh oh, you have a very, very tight window in which that process needs to run. And so as you can see, if you don't have multiple CPUs, well, what happens whenever we run two processes at the exact same time? Hard real-time is very hard to implement. So most are soft real-time algorithms. The one we have inside of Linux, there is a round robin soft real-time, and that is typically the one that, that runs inside of soft real-time. So once again, we talked about the time quantum. I probably should move this slide up. But whatever. So the time quantum is the amount of CPU time before it's either preempted or it yields back to the scheduler. So if I run a process for 10 seconds, well, that process gets to run for 10 seconds and it's using all the CPU. So it's executing millions to billions to trillions of instructions within those 10 seconds. However, nobody else gets to run. And so things that other things that needs to run, like if I move my mouse over to the next screen or back to this screen, that mouse isn't going to move because that process that moves the mouse from one screen to the next is not going to run. So we talked about Rob Robin, we talked about multi-level and we talked about multi-level feedback. 
And I just wanted to highlight what it looks like inside of Linux. Inside of Linux, they have what's called the CFS scheduler. It uses a red black tree algorithm or a data type. And essentially what happens is if you know anything about a red black tree, it's a balanced binary tree. And so what we do is we sort this. So it automatically balances. It uses colors, red and black. That way there is sorted. There's certain rules that are, that are associated with that. And what we do is we sort this. So it's balanced on what's called V runtime. So it's the amount of CPU time and there's an actual, there's runtime in the process that you will be using. So V runtime stands for virtual runtime. It just means here's how much CPU time that you've been given. It's not an actual seconds or something like that. It's just an index. That's why, hence the name virtual runtime. And so what we do is since we sort this red black tree as V runtime, this has the lowest V runtime, whereas the right hand side has the largest V runtime. And so with the completely fair scheduler, what we do is they prioritize lower V runtimes because this has had the fewest amount of CPU time to actually run. And so what we do is we store a pointer to the leftmost leaf of this red black tree, and that's the one that gets scheduled. That way they're, so what they're trying to do with the completely fair scheduler is balance out the runtime so that everybody gets a fair amount. And so that's how that scheduling item works. And that works fairly well, and it's what's used in the Linux operating system. So once again, we talked about scheduling. We talked about the terms of scheduling, what multitasking preemptive versus cooperative multitasking means. We talked about starvation, where I'm waiting for the CPU, but I'm not getting the CPU. We talked about priorities, how we actually can move processes. Okay, you just ran, but we might run you again based on your priority. We talked about arbitrations. Should two processes have the exact same priority? And as you saw with multi-level and multi-level feedback, we just run the round robin arbitration. And we talked about three different types of processes, the batch. Remember, batch has a defined runtime, and we know the inputs and how long it's going to take. There were two algorithms for that, first come, first serve, as well as shortest job first. And shortest job first is the most efficient way. We talked about real time, in which we have the soft real time versus hard real time. Hard real time is very hard to implement unless you have multiple functional units, CPUs, things like that. And then the one you interact, you usually use is the interaction or the interactive. That means we have an indefinite runtime. And so those, we have three different schedulers we can use. Round robin, multi-level, multi-level feedback. Remember, multi-level, as long as there's a high priority process, it keeps getting run. None of the lower priority process will ever run. So it's, it, uh, it, it's four shorter term processes than the longer term processes. But the one that used most, and like in the Linux kernel, it requires a data structure called the red black tree, but we use completely for a scheduler. So that's scheduling in a nutshell. And scheduling, once again, is sort of like process management, except in process management, we're actually talking about the process itself. How do we put it in the CPU? How do we take it off the CPU? Whereas scheduling is just which one gets picked next. So that's the difference between process management and process scheduling.